All right. So this is lecture four of ECE 5312. And so what we're going to do in today's lecture, as well as in the subsequent two lectures, is we're going to sort of lay the groundwork to the first part of this course. There are several parts, several modules that we're going to look at thematically. But the first one, before we jump into sort of doing an extensive analysis of communication systems using probability and um, expectations, like, you know, expectations and uh, Gaussian random variables, we need to understand a little bit about how communication work, a communication system works in general. So in essence, what a, a communication system does, as we see on the uh, slide here, um, is essentially we have a transmitter, we have a channel, we have a receiver. Simple, right? Where does that apply in today's world? Well, your cell phone is both transmitter and receiver. The channel is the air, the air interface, and the cell phone base station, which happens to be the, the, uh, the smokestack um, next to Boynton Hall, they just installed a cell phone tower right there, would be both the receiver and transmitter. So your cell phone, let's say you're talking to mom, or your wife, or your girlfriend, boyfriend, or whoever, you'll be talking, you're the transmitter, your cell phone converts your speech, digitizes it, makes it ones and zeros, and then there's a bunch of blocks that are in between that and the wireless signal that gets sent out by the antenna. There is an antenna in your cell phone over the air to a cell phone tower half, half a mile away. Actually, it's probably closer than half a mile away. And then the process is undone and turned into information that ultimately reaches its intended target. Right? So I mentioned blocks. And I'll get to that in a minute. And so what this lecture in particular is going to talk about are the blocks that we're not going to be looking much at all other than today. Okay? Because there's a lot involved in digital communications. And there are other courses which do cover this. But simply put, digital communications and data transmission is all about transmitting information across some channel that might have random properties, and then the receiver is trying to guess trying to make an educated uh, guess as to what, what, what has been intercepted, what was possibly transmitted, and try to recreate the message that was sent. So we call the message MT, and whenever we have a little hat over anything, we, it usually signifies, at least in this course, reconstructed, right? So the reconstructed MT hat, that's what our receiver is trying to put together based on what it only observes coming in from the channel, right? Our goal, and this is what people pay a lot of money for, right, is essentially trying to minimize this. The goal is we're trying to minimize the times where the receiver creates, recreates a message, and it does not match what was actually sent. That's what we call, remember the fundamental unit in this course is the bit. And when we have bits that don't match, it's a bit error. We're trying to minimize that. So the goal of this course is to minimize the bit errors. Whenever we, we transmit a whole bunch of bits across a channel, we receive it, and then, oh, there's, there's an error, oh, there's an error, there's an error. It, it might not be a problem, or it could be a catastrophic problem. It really depends on what your applications are. And, and it's true. Like, for instance, we usually me measure bit, bit errors in terms of 10 to the minus whatever. And what do I mean by that? What's 10 to the minus? So for instance, voice communications, we usually target a bit error rate. This is not packetized voice. Let me, let me uh, reiterate. So, so but just like, let's say we take voice, like speech, and we discretize it and send it over the air in some narrow band transmission and pick it up. We usually tolerate uh, 10 to the minus 3 bit error rate. What does that mean? One out of every thousand bits is an error. And that's cool. You know, the human mind does a great job smoothing out things, you know. You'd be amazed. Like, you know, some of the military um, codecs out there, speech codecs, like MELP and stuff, sounds awful, but all you need is intelligibility. All you need to know is, oh, I can hear the command to retreat, right, or something like that. Not, not, who cares about crystal clear, perfect speech? It's not necessary, right? Other codecs, um, that might be more important, but 10 to the minus 3 is generally the rule of thumb when we're trying to, like, you know, if you want decent performance, good performance for voice, 10 to minus 3 is good. Data, like emails and, you know, file transfers and such, uh, like over wireless and such, 
10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. So one error out of, what, 10,000, 100,000 bits transmitted. So a little bit more stringent in terms of bit error. And part of it's because of bandwidth. Imagine we're sending so much more data so quickly. If we have one out of every 1,000 bits is an error, you know, we're just like flooding our tons of errors. So we do, we do actually try and keep the errors to a minimum in that case, to 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6. Fiber optics, where we're talking like huge bandwidths, right? Imagine you had 10 to the minus 3 on a fiber optic. You're just basically transmitting error. Why even bother, right? So fiber optics, we usually target 10 to the minus 9 at least in terms of the tolerance for the bit error. So depending on your application, you have different bit errors, right? So what do we do? How do we fight this sort of problem with the bit error rate? And so there are several techniques. So these black boxes, this transmitter and this receiver, uh, let's, let's take this one step further. So that transmitter and that receiver actually has a lot going underneath. Peel away some of the layers. So the transmitter has something called a binary source. That could be human speech. That could be readings from a thermometer, which probably will say, what, like minus uh, 15, minus 20 degrees Celsius outside. Um, it, could, it could say a whole bunch of analog things that then get digitized into ones and zeros. Anything is just a random generator of ones and zeros. It then goes through this suspicious thing called the source encoder. Source encoder. And then it goes into a channel encoder. And then, because you know, I'm kind of sloppy in my drawing skills and I didn't think about it until after I drew the diagram, the modulator, okay? The modulator, we're going to talk about starting in lecture six, which will be later tonight. And then there's something where it goes through the analog to digital conversion and, and subsequently goes through an RF chain because, you know, heaven forbid we transmit at zero hertz as a center frequency. We want to bring it up to some reasonable carrier frequency, right? Megahertz, tens of megahertz, hundred megahertz, thousands of megahertz, gigahertz in transmission. And there's a course for that in terms of the properties of RF front ends and RF propagation, which we won't talk about too much in this class. The receiver does the almost exact opposite of what the transmitter does. It receives a signal at that high frequency. Let's say you're transmitting on 2.4 gigahertz. It brings it down to what we call baseband, where everything's centered at zero hertz. It then digitizes it. D -d 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 -d. It turns it into ones in, well, it samples it. So you have now discrete time samples. And then you demodulate it. Then you channel decode it. So your basic, uh, I'll explain what a channel decoder does. And then you then do source decoding. And then it goes into a sync, which could be a Skype client on the target computer that you're sending messages to, right? So, OK, so I mentioned source encoder and channel encoder. And these sound really cool, right? What are these things? So it turns out that in some cases, information, binary information that's produced by the binary is redundancy. Perfect example in the world. Like, let's forget about wireless comms and digital comms. So how many people here have ever made a bitmap before, bitmap image? Right? Like, if you've ever took a screen capture of your desktop, you've made a bitmap image, right? They, they tend to be very big. Has anybody ever tried to use WinZip on a bitmap image? Yeah, right? And how much is it compressed by? 99%. Why? The bitmap file and all the information contains tons of redundant information. And what WinZip or GZip or tarring and then GZ and all that, what it does is it says, oh, here's a long string of ones and zeros that repeats here, 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 here. I'm going to replace it by a code word three, four digits. So I replace hundreds of bits with just a small code word. Here's another repeating pattern that's appearing everywhere, code word. So the goal of the source encoder is to remove as much redundancy as possible, right? It's almost like take that bit, like if you, let, let's say you two guys. So Neil, um, you, you have this bitmap. Let's say your screen, you want to share it with Ryan, right? And so you're going to send by email. What are you going to do? Drag two megabyte bitmap into email, click send, and he's like, what? You know, you wasted all that time and Outlook is stuck and then finally two megabytes comes through? 
Or are you nice? You zip it. It's only a few kilobytes. Send it over, and Ryan's like, oh, boop. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Neil. Right? Of course, what happens is depends on how your network's set up. If it's like, sees a zip file, it might flag and say virus or something. But that's a separate issue altogether, right? Um, but, but seriously, communications is the exact same thing. Do you send everything, including the kitchen sink, over to channel? Or do you just send just as compressed amount of data as, much, uh, as little as possible across such that it can be recreated at the other end? And the answer is you don't want to waste that precious resource called bandwidth, transmission time, power, because it takes energy for these radios to do all that processing. So the less processing, the better to send it over the channel. Channel coder is like a contradiction. Throwing a redundancy into that. But it's different. I can't control the redundancy from the binary source all that well. So that's why I take it out. It doesn't help me any. So I just remove that redundancy. The channel coder is my intentional effort to con introduce controlled redundancy into the sequence to protect it against bit error. So it's almost like, for instance, I'm talking with my wife, and you know she, she has a soft voice. And she'll say something from the basement, and I'm upstairs on, on the second floor, and I didn't hear it. So I say, what? And then I hear it again, and I think I knew what she said. I say, what? And so the third time's a charm. Then I extract from, let's say, the redundancy of that transmission, all she says, oh, um, the, uh, the, the, the soup that's on the stove, the, the stove needs to be turned off. Oh, OK, run down, turn it off. The same thing can be said about the channel encoder. It's almost like, imagine if you are in an environment where potentially information can be corrupted, like a one is transmitted, but your channel flips it to a zero. That's a problem. So I throw in redundancy. What I do? The easiest thing, there's something called repetition code. Okay? And what the repetition code does is essentially take every binary bit of information, one or zero, repeat it n number of times. Usually odd, because you want a majority rule. So let's say I send everything three times over. So hi, 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 how, 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 r, 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 u, u, u. And let's say one of those times, one of my words gets distorted and you couldn't hear it. You would base, based on the other two copies of that exact same word, you say, oh, the word how was sent. Right? You fill in the gap. And there are more elegant ways of doing, introducing that type of redundancy. So, so, so what this lecture is going to talk about primarily is this thing called source coding and channel coding. But we're not, after today's lecture, this course will not touch these topics anymore. Channel coding would be like an information. Source coding, if you do something like image processing, you'll see tons of source coding uh, type e examples, algorithms, lossless, lossy, and such. This course, we're going to talk about because you should know that's part of the transmission and receiving chain, but that's about it. All right? Our interests are going to be in the stuff after that, the modulation, the conversion of that binary data once it's been source and channel coded. Because again, I don't care. I'm looking at the bit level. and be able to take that and say, let's convert it into a waveform that I can transmit across the channel. Okay. So source coding, what I mentioned before, consists of, let's say you have something called source symbols. So the output, let's say that source symbol is a pattern of bits that we see time and time again. And say, OK, we've got to do something. This stuff is taking so much space in our transmission. What the, what the source symbols happens is you go past through the source encoder. And then you have this other set of vectors. It's a sequence of what they call source encoded symbols. And what the source encoded symbols are is the representation, which we hope is smaller in length, that represents you, the source uh, symbols. Okay. Okay. So as I said, the source encoder strips out redundancy, which is fantastic. And you know how powerful is this stuff? Well, for example, <laughs> I love this example because I, I get to see how, how many people are as crazy as I am in this class. So how many people here, how many people here uh, use, uh, who pick up, um, let's say, TV channels over the air using antennas? One? Sort of two? Oh my god. I'm in good company, okay? Because I, I thought I, I, I would I would raise my hand. So so digital, right? Yeah. So the okay, okay, whoo, okay. The, that, that's that's good to know. 
Um, so, so for the rest of you that you are dependent on cable, or no, just, just kidding. So what happens is there was a time before you had cable TV or satellite TV where the only way to pick up TV channels was by what they call rabbit ears. And rabbit ears on the desktop, on the top of the TV, the reception's not great. But if you have a really nice Yagi antenna that you put on your roof and you point it to Boston, I'm, I think I'm about 39 miles away from my TV tower. And so I'm perfect. I pick up ION, My56. I don't pay a thing. It's free. <laughs> the only thing is, um, the only thing is, it, it was kind of interesting. But like, yeah, long story, but uh, let's just say, uh, if you want anything else, just just download it, from, you know, stream it from uh, from Hulu Plus or or Amazon or something. But it was interesting before before 2009, we had both digital and we had analog TV channels in the United States. There are lots of parts of the world that still have analog and digital TV channels, and so. What happens is an analog TV channel, that was a predecessor, that, that was like from the 1950s. You had one channel, it was modulated a certain way, you had your rabbit ears on your TV, it picked up the signal and said, okay, I'm going to decode it, boom, right? And it was all analog for the most part, right? Then digital came along, and it was kind of interesting because what happened? That analog waveform takes 6 megahertz of spectrum. And it's between 450 megahertz to 750 megahertz. That's the television spectrum band. That's a big chunk of spectrum. It's very attractive, too. It's below 1 gigahertz, has great propagation characteristics. Um, and, and a lot of people are looking at it nowadays because it's, we're not using all of it. Can we use it in some sort of secondary fashion to transmit our own information across? Like 802.22 is one. Um, a lot, public safety is another. Um, a lot of folks are using it. I, I bet you in a heartbeat, there's like at least half a dozen companies that would say, wow, I could use the spectrum to do X, Y, Z, right? Digital came out a, quite a bit later, but the nice thing about it is it's, it's totally a digital format, and you might wonder why does, let's say, your local PBS channel, like in our case it's uh, WGBH in Boston, we have WGBH44 create, and we have all these other, and the reason is, because of the digital modulation and the source coding, right? I believe digital TV uses MPEG-2 in the United States in order to source code. What happens is because of all that source coding, all that redundant information with the images that we're transmitting over, I can fit eight, eight channels in the same six megahertz as the one analog TV channel. So no wonder in 2009, I was there. Well, we were all there, but I was watching. I was with my PhD students for Kent at the time, we were on Bunker Hill at 11 o'clock at night with a spectrum analyzer, watching the TV channels shut down, other digital TV channels moving all over the place. It was a blast until the U.S. Park Service police pulled up next to us and they asked what we were doing. Oh, we're looking at the TV channels turning off. And then they, in turn, they asked, uh, oh, we heard about a car break-in somewhere around here. I guess it's not you guys. No, no, not, so, not at all. But, this, but the reason is there are a lot of advantages. Imagine now... You can fit the same amount of information, the video information, that we perceive to be pretty good, right? HDTV in eight channels, what used to be just one. So you're happy because you have this nice, crisp digital format. Like, you know, you don't have to worry about snow. Edit or you don't, for the most part. And the other thing is the TV channel services, they're happy too. PBS or let's say a commercial entity, now you have eight channels. Advertising went up quite a bit. Think about it, eight times the number of commercials. So anyways, it's an aside. But because of source encoding and digital modulation, we can more efficiently communicate, uh, you know, visual, like video or any sort of information across a medium in, in, and, 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 and would have the same sort of quality as that maybe even better than what would be with an analog format. So that, this is just sort of like a high-level description of like source, source coding. Now, channel coding is a little bit different. So let's say we take the source encoded information and we say, okay, this guy is vulnerable. If we're going to have errors, we might even have problem reconstructing the data, right? 
So what we do is we introduce this redundancy. And there's a variety of ways. But what, what essentially the goal of a channel encoder is to correct for those channel errors when they do happen. So what you do is you take those source encoded symbols, right, the Vs. And let's say you have a variety of different possible outputs of your source encoder, so VL. And what you want to do is you want to assign every possible source encoded word, okay, sim a set of symbols, by a, a unique code word. And we'll call it CL. And so what happens is CL actually contains a few extra bits. And there's a variety of ways we can use those few extra bits. What happens is that redundancy will be our backup in case we do have any errors. So the simplest thing is the parity. error in these number of bits. What do we do? We have this little thing at the end, like, or let's say several bits at the end, that if there's any bit flipping and we have like some sort of binary arithmetic, it should check out at the end. If it doesn't, like a checksum. And so let's say the check is supposed to be 101, but we get 111. Oh, I think there's a corruption somewhere. So at the very least, we can be informed that there is an issue going on. In a more, let's say, elegant approach for a panel encoder, it might attempt to reconstruct, if there's enough information, what was corrupted. So I mentioned repetition code, right? Repeat everything, every single bit, by three times, seven times, ten, uh, no, not ten, eleven times, an odd number of times. So that, let's say, even if, heaven forbid, not just one bit, but two or three gets corrupted, you still have, um, let me think, eight other bits that say otherwise, and you can reconstruct those guys. So majority rules, right? And that's just one example, but there are a variety of ways of doing the channel encoding. But the premise is you have a code word that represents that source encoded set of symbols, and that code word has some sort of properties that allow you to reconstruct if there's an error or two or three, right? Beautiful thing. But, and it's kind of interesting to note. So we have something here where what ends up happening is we use this term. So if you know any friends that deal with channel coding, there's something called the code rate. Okay? And what the code rate is is the ratio of source encoded symbols. Okay? So this, this pattern coming into the channel coder, this pattern bits is k long. And the corresponding code word should be longer. It's the ratio of the original size number of bits and the channel encoded number of bits is equal to the code rate. So if I say this channel encoder has a code rate of one third, it means I'm putting in three times the amount of redundant information. So basically, I'm doing something that makes that channel encoded symbol three times as long, right? So I'm putting that much information. Sometimes people talk about code rates of like two thirds, right? So somehow, there one and a half, you know, the, 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 there's one and a half times, um, no, not one and a half times, eh, no, one and a half times the amount of redundant information thrown into that, that transmission. So, for instance, here's the example I was telling you about. So, for instance, you have a rate one third repetition code. So, remember, the uh, person who repeats three times everything. Um, and you have no source encoding, which is fine. You're totally, it's totally cool to leave out the source encoder. What would happen is you would have essentially your code word. So if this is your VL, let's say this is V1, you would get as your unique code word 111. It's just repeated three times. And V2, which is equal to 0, would be 000. So your code book, which contains all your code words, will be either 000 or 111. At the receiver, your channel decoder will be expecting either one of these two patterns, 000 or 111. If there is a flipped bit, let's say I get 001, that's when the channel, encode, channel decoder jumps into action. Let's actually draw it. <laughs> I know, I just couldn't wait to, to draw it, so I'm, I'm going to do that now. Okay. Fun times. Okay, where we go. So, so, so what happens is, for instance, 
So let's say I have my source encoder. So that's my shorthand, source SRC and enc for encoder. And so let's say I have the pattern 10110010, right? And then it goes into my channel encoder. Okay? And let's say my code book is 000 and 111. And that represents my 0, and that represents my 1. Now, what happens is it goes to all the other stages. It goes over some channel. It gets corrupted. Okay, so unhappy face. And then what happens is that goes into my channel decoder. Decoder. So let's say the channel encoder here, based on the repetition code, okay, of rate one third. So we'll have a code rate of one third is going to say one one one, right? Zero 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 one 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 zero 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 and so on, right? Suppose you get as the input to your channel encoder one 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 zero zero one 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 zero one one zero and then zero one zero and so on and so forth. So what you do is the channel encoder in the simplest case is going to look at pairs of three and it's going to say, okay, what is it? One, one, one? Whew! That's a one. Right? So the output is a one. Zero, zero, one. Okay, uh, there's a one, but there are two zeros, so the probability of having two bits flipped is actually pretty low, so we're going to say this is a zero. That guy, same logic. One. One. Zero. And so what we get is one zero one one zero. Does that match above? You bet. Of course, what happens is, although the probability of getting more than one bit flip for let's say repetition code of three um, is low, lower than let's say just like let's say if, if you have two bits flipped within the same code word, the probability is very low, but it's not zero, and it does happen, right? What happens is then you can choose, let's say, if, you, if you're dealing in very, very unfortunate environments, what you can do instead is use code rates of five and repeat more. But there's a trade-off. There's a practical trade-off. The more redundancy you throw in, right, the less actual useful information you communicate across, right? You can only protect so much, and then afterwards, is it really worth using 1 over 33 code rate to transmit across. It's going to be almost error-free, right? We'll talk about that a little bit too, Shannon capacity. But is it really worth it? Because let's say you're trying to transmit video, it's almost like, you know, like you go to a place and it has really poor Wi-Fi, there's like over 100 people in the room using Wi-Fi at the same time as you, and you're trying to watch a video, and, and everyone's like, why are you watching video? Aren't you paying attention to class? Oh. And what happens is you just see the YouTube video that you're trying to watch getting stuck all the time, stuck all the time, because that throughput's not coming across. So you could use a very robust channel encoding scheme, but if you put too much redundancy, is it really worth the, the drop in throughput? Right? Trade off. Yep. Sorry? Yes. So, so why? Okay, so the question is, uh, why did I choose an odd number of redundancy? Ah, that, that is an excellent question. That requires the red pen, okay? So what happens is, let's say I send 1111. One, one, one. Let's say I have a repetition code rate of 1 fourth, okay? Zero, 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 zero. Let's say bad things happen to this. So I'm going to draw basically things that look like it's bad, right? Bad. And so the output of that would be, one one zero zero, and then let's say zero 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 one. Okay, so take the first four, take the second four. This obviously is zero. This, I don't know what is it going to be, right? So what happens is we don't want a tie. We really want, like you know, if it's going to be majority wrong, well, th there's not much we can do avoid it, to avoid it, and the probability of that is going to be much lower 
But if we have a 50-50, the last thing I want my communication system to do is do a coin toss. Okay? Good question. Good question. All right. So that's 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 sort of the example of uh, code rates and such. But um, there's a few things that came out of this. So you can represent coding graphically, and maybe my friends in information theory might might like look at me with horror and say, "You're teaching it this way." Um, but let's let's look at this again from another perspective. So we can do this graphically, and in fact, let's 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 actually. Yeah, you know I want to play with the uh, the funny electronic pen thing. Okay, so what happens is the following. There's something called, let, let's say we have that, this guy here, let's say the 1 is represented by 1, 1, 1, right? So we have a code rate of 1 third. And let's say 0 is represented by 0, 0, 0, correct? So what happens is what are the all the possible other... 3-bit options that my receiver could pick up. 110, 101, 011. And then at this end, 001, 010, and then 100. And so what we have is a situation where, is there a way that we can graphically represent the, all these patterns and use a sort of quantitative metric? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's called Hamming distance. Right? So you have Hamming windows, now you also have Hamming distance. So what is the Hamming distance, or dh, of 111 and 000? And the answer is, it is basically the, max, it's basically the difference between the, uh, the, the number of positions in each of the binary sequences that differ. In this case, three. All three positions differ. So the Hamming distance of this guy is 3. So as a result, the dh here, my dog would be howling right now if he heard that. So what happens is we have a Hamming distance of 3. I'm going to use another concept here, which is called the decoding sphere. So those patterns that would naturally, if you saw it at the receiver, at the uh, channel decoder, would say, oh, that's obviously 111. We would put it into sort of one of two possible buckets. So this would be the decoding sphere. For 111, and this, and in fact, there shouldn't be an overlap. My bad. This is the decoding sphere for 0, 0, 0. So what the decoding sphere tells us is any of these triplets any get mapped to that pattern and therefore be decoded as a 0. And in this circle, everything would be decoded as 1, 1, 1, which be a 1, right? And so that's what we have in the example on the next slide, essentially. So we have something called the Hamming distance. And so it's a cool metric because what would happen is, let's say, this is the Hamming distance between 111 and 101. And the answer would be 1. So what the, the graphic that I have on the um, slide over on, 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 the, on the computer here shows is essentially I take all the Hamming distances and I say, OK, this has a short Hamming distance. This has a Hamming distance of 1. That has a Hamming distance of 1. That has a Hamming distance of 1. These guys, on the other hand, if I try and do the Hamming distance, let's say him to there, oh, that's 2. That's way too far. I'm going to go with the guy that has the closer Hamming distance, the smaller Hamming distance. So then on this side, same thing. All these guys here have the shorter Hamming distance to 0, 0, 0 than to 1, 1, 1. So that's how I decode. So, so in a very basic way, this is how your channel decoder would say, OK, I'm mapping this code word that might be corrupted to the nearest corresponding uh, actual code word. So corrupted we map it to the actual code word 
using decoding spheres and Hamming distances. All righty. So sometimes we model the decoding of code words and stuff using something called a binary symmetric channel, right? Okay, come on. So this is cool because I think you might have seen this before as well, in, especially in the uh, previous homework assignment. So what happens is the binary symmetric channel is an excellent example of where you have conditional probability. What is the probability that I'm going to receive something on the branch that was initially transmitted from this branch? It's a condition, right? So what, what the binary symmetric channel basically represents is if I send a 1, what is the probability I'm going to receive a 1? Oh, it's 1 minus p. And if I send a 0, what is the probability I'm going to receive a 0? Oh, 1 over p. Oh, 1 minus p. What is the probability that I get a 1 and it gets accidentally flipped and becomes a 0? That's p. And likewise, send a 0, get a 1, that's also p. So what happens is um, the binary symmetric channel is great if you want to model. Like, let's say um, a situation where you say, OK, um, my bits will be flipped with this sort of probability if there's 1s to zeros and zeros to 1. So what ends up happening is we, 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 we use these decoding spheres in order to, like once we use the proper channel coding scheme to sort of um, mitigate the effects of this very symmetric channel. And it's, and it's all, it really comes down to conditional probability. In fact, if you take a probability course at the graduate level, they'll talk about like, you know, what is the probability of receiving a one, right? And well, you'll have to combine the conditional probability of one, you sent a 1, and you get a 1, and you sent a 0, and gets flipped into a 1. And what is the probability of both situ situations happening, right? So nice little practical example. And so what happens is whenever you have one of the diagonals happening, that's when you have a flipped error. That's when you have a flipped bit. That's when you have an error. All right. So decoding spheres, if you want a mathematical expression, what ends up happening is you can use something like this. So that beautiful L and backwards L, we refer to that as a floor function. Right? I think even in MATLAB they have something called floor. And so what the floor function does is so you have your Hamming distance, the minimum Hamming distance. And so what I mean by minimum Hamming distance? Let's suppose you have a code book and it consists more than two code words. Let's say you have 10 or 15 or 19 or 24 code words. What you want to do is find out which two code words in that code book have the least amount of separation between the two. So minimum Hamming distance. You subtract one off of it and then divide by two. And so what, ha what ends up happening is that will dictate to you what your radius will be equal to, right? So what happens is, like, just like what I drew on the slide here, and, and, and it was really badly drawn, so my apologies. What, what, hap what happens here, in fact, I wish I could redraw it, but I'm not, no, I'm not going to do it. But what it happens here is, what I mean to say is, let's say here's your minimum Hamming distance. There's only two code words. It's a three, right? And so if we take this principle, T, floor, d h min minus 1 over 2. So this guy here is 3. So 3 minus 1 is 2, divided by 2 is, and then floor it, just in case it has a decimal, but it's not, is equal to 1. That is our radius, and that is our radius. So, so what happens is we're looking for all code words that are corrupted that can be mapped to 1, 1, 1, that's within a radius, a Hamming distance of 1, and happens to be these three. Yay! And same thing for 0. So that's how mathematically you would get that distance. Okay? All right. Now, I mentioned that, you know, repetition code, it's nice, easy, intuitive, people can understand it. There are a variety of other types of channel coding schemes, again, an information theory class would be very, very helpful in order to appreciate all of them. Um, but there are, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about, like, you know, what are some possible schemes. So there are things like, there's something called random coding. 
And so what happens is for random coding, uh, you would use a code book uh, for one experiment, and then you would choose totally a, a totally different random code book for another experiment. So every different experiment and different trans different code book, right? Correlation, if you will, between one code book and the next. And so with random coding, it's not very practical because your transmitter and receiver absolutely need to be in sync. The book is being used at any given time. But um, this code book was actually used by Claude Shannon, as we'll talk about him now, the great Claude Shannon, uh, when he developed his channel coding theorem, which was, it turned out, invented and came up with in 1948. So Shannon's channel coding theorem talks about something called capacity. Capacity can mean many things. It could mean number of users supported in a cell site. It could mean the amount of throughput supported by a, uh, by a channel. It uh, could be a number of transmissions supported by an overall channel. There are a variety of different definitions of what is capacity. So in this case, we have this capacity metric C. And what this, uh, the channel capacity is, um, it, it, let's say, of like some sort of uh, uh, you know, digital communication scheme that uses channel coding. And the channel coding has a fixed coding rate of k over n. Remember k over n, the ratio? So k is the original source encoded symbols. And n is the length of the code word that comes out of the channel encoder. Now what happens is, let's keep this constant. It turns out that if we increase n, we increase the size of this guy in order to maintain the same coding rate, we also have to have the code word, uh, it's the source encoded word going into the channel encoder also to increase. So the mapping from source encoded symbols at the input to the code, channel encoder code word at the output, they both have to be proportional in order for the ratio to be the same, constant throughout all. Now it turns out that if you let n, the size of your code words, go to infinity, your probability of error will approach zero. That is a very desirable situation. But that only works up to a limit for specific code rates. So what Shannon, so what Shannon came up with, essentially an expression, which we'll see in the next slide, that tells you for code rate and a certain signal to noise ratio and a bandwidth, you can attain Using that specific code rate, you can attain zero errors in that transmission up to that code rate, and then afterwards there is no, absolutely no guarantee of having zero errors. There will be errors. So that's uh, that's the uh, so so let's let's look at this. so basically C is the limit on the rate of reliable communications. It's an absolute limit, and it's great for several reasons. Mainly, it serves as something that you can compare the performance of two systems with. So this is the benchmark, and then you have two other systems. How well did you do relative to this limit? It also is a sanity check. You would be amazed how often people say, oh, you came up with this excellent coding scheme? How does it do relative to Shannon capacity? And if it ever exceeds it, mm, you're crazy. It's almost like, oh, I invented this car, and it goes faster than the speed of light. Oh, yeah? Yeah, really? You know? It, yes? So the Shannon scheme is ADDN, right? So if the channel's not that, you can beat it. Ex Exactly. So this is only for like an AWGN channel uh, conditions. Uh, otherwise, yeah, all, all bits are off. Excellent. <laughs> so it's all about reliability, right? And so this beautiful expression comes out like so. He ca so he came up with that. He also came up with the capacity expression. So that's the information capacity of the channel. So if you take an information theory, you're definitely going to see that. And so. Is, uh, here's, here's the kicker. So Shannon uh, came up with the, um, these expressions, right, for the channel capacity and the coding theorem and such, but he never tells you how to attain it, right? And it's kind of interesting. I remember when I went to grad school, the big thing, especially during my PhD studies, was turbo code. Well, just the name alone, turbo codes, you know? It's, it's like, it, I don't know, I, uh, you know, it's, it's a great jazzy marketing technique for basically iterative coding, 
right? You, or, and you have soft decisions and everything. And then uh, you recently, you also have LDPC codes, right? Even though they're not so recent. It was, I believe, they were initially published in a thesis by, uh, a PhD thesis by Gallagher, who is a faculty at MIT. I think he's an emeritus now. And um, he was a protege of Shannon, right? So you have LDPC codes. Those tend to be very long, too. And turbo codes, the problem is um, it took forever to, to really assess them. People were looking at FPGA implementations and such. So it was very, it was a lot of fun. But what happens is what this also did is it kind of spurred on a kind of not a war, but a competition. Whenever you set a goal saying, who can come closest to Shannon's capacity? Then everybody says, oh, I have a scheme that's like 3.2 dB away from Shannon capacity. Then someone says, I came up with a scheme that was 3.1 dB away from Shannon capacity. And everyone's like inching closer and such, right? And that's good. You know, friendly competition is always very helpful in, in, in innovation. So really what happens is the, the usefulness of this bound is, first of all, it, it sort of tells us what is the maximum achievable rates that we can attain and have, uh, you know, given a bandwidth signal to noise ratio, right? And it, it tells us, like, you know, what's the best possible that we can attain given these circumstances. It also gives us sort of a trade-off analysis between the bandwidth and the signal to noise ratio for a spe specific in, in, in situation. And it could also be used for comparing, let's say, the noise performance between two or more type of modulation schemes. So it's nice because in communications and engineering, especially like let's say we, if you do research, like it's one thing if you, you come up with, let's say, a new type of transmission scheme, but if you're going to show it or share it with the rest of the world, especially in a peer-reviewed venue, you've got to have a benchmark against it, right? You compare it against maybe the current state of the art, or maybe you compare it against a sort of more or accepted approach um, and, and such. And the capacity limit here kind of offers that. Every, everyone universally accepts Shannon capacity and, 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 and the like as, as sort of a benchmark for sort of assessing how well or how poorly your system is actually performing. All right? Okay, so with that, um, that concludes um, lecture four for, for now. So, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a five. We're going to start at.